Oh, you have to have an invitation. Yeah, yeah you have to be yeah, another. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Darren. Darren? Darren, we should be live now. Hey, I should be live now. Nine seconds. Okay. Let me know. Stay on the line. Okay. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. We're back. And you hear me, ladies and gentlemen. You getting anything? Say it again. Are you getting anything? You got, you got on Come on, okay. All right, so we'll continue. Sorry for the delay. It's beyond our control. There's nothing we can do except have patience. Where did we hear that before? <laughs> I don't know. These llamas didn't lie. Anyway, now that we're celebrating New Year, the passing of time, nothing like a good lesson on impermanence. This is from a book called... Um, Death and Dying, the Tibetan tradition. Anyway, this is a famous story, a famous poem in Tibet. His Holiness, I'll read a little bit of the introduction. Glenn Mullen compiled all this and translated it. It's very good. It's in a different title now, slightly, but uh, The Art of Living is something, but it's the same book. Um, this is a person named Lama Guntang Kanchuk Dronme. He was a contemporary of the 8th Dalai Lama. Uh, in the... Uh, this current Dalai Lama's uh, explanation of the uh, long life prayer, of the swift return prayer of Rinpoche, he calls him Nawang uh, Dronme, uh, something like that. We may have this writings of Chungla in a previous uh, incarnation. I don't know. Speculation. But anyway, the advice is good, no matter who said it, you know. So it's widely distributed uh, among Tibetans, it's very famous. And it's called a, a conversation with an old man. Uh, His Holiness uh, taught it and gave out free booklets of it in 1978 in Dharamsala. Pabanka Rinpoche refers to it a lot of times in the Tapa uh, Lakpacha, uh, the liberation of the palm of your hand. So Lama Gungtang was very famous. So it's a thing where a Lama is sitting there, an old man is sitting on the road, and a young man walks by and... and uh, tells and looks at him and is sort of disgusted, you know. Uh, and it turns out who this old man is is not an ordinary person. It turns out it's a yogi, and he gives you him this thing. So I'll start right away. This is on page 84 of this book. Lama Guntan Kanchak Dronme. Dronme Tempe is one of the names of, of Rato Chungla. So we wonder. We'll find out. We'll have... We'll have detectives on the case. Yes, no, they're, they're off duty. Homage to the Buddhas who, having abandoned the seeds of cyclic existence, are beyond the suffering nature of birth, sickness, age, and death. May they inspire us to cut the chains of wandering in samsaric realms. Once upon a time, <laughs> a haggard old man lay exhausted by the road in a wilderness. A haughty youth appeared, and this is the conversation that followed. Old man, in sitting, walking, or working, you are unlike anyone I have seen. What is it that afflicts you? To this the old man replied, O youth who flies in the pride of having strong flesh and blood, listen to me. For many years ago I was even stronger than you. In running I could outrun a horse, and when I wanted to trap, I caught even the wild yak of the north. I was as light on my feet as the birds of the air and my face as handsome as that of a god. I wore magnificent clothing, adorned myself with jewels, ate the finest delicacies, and rode the most swift of horses. Today he'd have a jaguar or something, who knows. There was no sport I did not play, and no pleasure I did not know. I gave not a single thought to death, at, or the advent of old age. The noise of the friends and relatives who surrounded me constantly held my attention and turned my face from everything else. But the stealthy suffering of age slowly pressed in upon me. <laughs> At first, I did not notice it. And when I did, it was too late. Now, when I look in the mirror, I am repelled by what I see. When one receives tantric initiation, the initiation waters first touch one's head and then descend through the body. 
Death comes in a similar fashion. The crown of one head, one's head turns white and then symptoms descend. My hair is white as a seashell. I did not wash out the color. The Lord of Death has spat on me and the frost of his spittle covers my head. Where in the, get an umbrella. You know, never mind. The many lines and wrinkles on my face are not folds in the baby fat of youth. They are time measurements sketched by the hand keeper of time. By the hand of the keeper of time, rather. This constant squinting of my eyes is not caused by smoke. My powers of vision have diminished, and I must squint in order to see. When I lean forward like this and cup my ear in order to listen, it is not that I expect you to whisper me a secret message, but to me all sounds seem remote, and I must strain in order to hear. Oh. Droplets fall unexpectedly from my nose. This is the ice of my youth being melted by the sun of old age, not pearls falling from a necklace. Very poetic. That's very nice. My teeth have all fallen out. This was not part of a cycle, heralding, heralding the growth of new teeth. The meals of this life have been eaten, and the cutlery therefore put away. The teeth is a cutlery. Listen. I do not continually drool because I want to anoint the earth with water. Rather, all that I once enjoyed now only disgusts me, and my spittle drops of its own accord. My unclear conversation is not a dialect learned in some cold, foreign land. Once I indulged in meaningless talk without end, and my tongue is now worn out. This ugly face that you see is not a monkey's mask that I wear. It's just not that my mask of youth, mine only on loan for a short while, has now been taken back. Only the ugly bones of death remain. You're getting it hard. <laughs> this constant wobbling of my head is not a sign of my disapproval. Lord of death has struck me with his club, and ever since then my brain is unsteady. This manner of walking that you see, my eyes cast down the road, is not in order to find the needle that has been lost. The jewels of my youth have fallen to earth, and I walk in a daze, barely able to remember my own name. The way I rise on four limbs is not a playful imitation of an animal's ways. My legs will no longer support me, so I must use both arms and legs to move. The way I drop down when I sit is not intended as a display of bad manners. The threads of my happiness have been broken, and the cords of my youth have been cut. Hence, I can no longer move with grace. When I walk, I stagger, not as a way to show off and pretend I am a big man, but because the burden of age rides heavily upon me, and I cannot walk properly. This constant shaking of my hands is not because I itch for jewels. The eye of death is upon me, waiting to steal life's gem from my hands, and I tremble in apprehension. The restricted diet that I follow is not so fixed because I am a miser. My digestive powers have diminished, and I fear to die of overeating. All this comes to us, by the way. <laughs> The light clothing that I wear is not planned for a fancy dress party. My physical strength has so diminished that even clothing is a burden to me. The way I breathe so heavily is not because I am reciting prayers for the benefit of others. It is a sign that soon the breath of my life will melt into the sky. My extraordinary manner of behavior is not an extraordinary artistic expression. I am held by the demon of death, and I have no way to act as I wish. I continually forget what I am doing, not in order to demonstrate that I have no respect for endeavor, but because my brain is worn out and my memory and intelligence have grown dim. There's no need to laugh at me, for all receive their share of old age. Within the span of a few years, the first messengers of death will come to you too. My words have not yet impressed you, but soon the same condition will fall upon you. These days people do not live long, and you have no guarantee to see as many years as I have. Even if you reach me in years, there is no assurance that you will have even the powers of body, speech, and mind demonstrated by this feeble man before you. The youth was repelled and cried out in disgust, Oh, you miserable creature, despised by men and harassed by dogs, your body is ugly and spent. I would rather choose to die now than to remain alive in your condition. The old man smiled. You want to be young forever? And you do not wish to become old? You say you prefer death to old age, but when the time of your death draws near, you will discover that it is not so easy to face death willingly and with confidence. If one never harms the gentle, 
always guards one's spiritual precepts and follows a threefold application of study, contemplation, and meditation, perhaps it would be easy to die happily. He's coming out as a yogi. This guy stumbled upon a good teacher. But my mind did not for a moment give thought to spiritual values. Even though my body has grown old, I now cherish every day as an opportunity to train in the principles of Dharma, and I do not want to die so soon. When the old man has spoken thus, the attitude of the youth was transformed. Yes, aged one, it is true. What, what I have seen with my eyes and what I have heard with my ears indeed confirm what you have said. Your words have moved me deeply. The sufferings of age are indeed great. You are old and have gained much experience. So tell me truly, is there no method by which one can overcome this terror? The old man smiled once more. Yes, there are such methods, and these are not particularly difficult. Everything that is born must die, and not many live even to old age. To live and not to die would require the fabulous elixir of immortality, and that seems rather difficult to acquire. All great beings of the past have died, Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, saints, and kings alike, the righteous as well as the sinful. All must one day face death. How can you be any different? However, if one practices the spiritual path, the mind abides in joy regardless of one's age, and when death falls, one is like a child, gleefully returning to his home. Even Buddha did not speak of a more profound method than this. This is my innermost advice to you. It is from my heart, not just my mouth. Your fate is in your own hands, and you must follow your deeper instincts. That's us. He's talking to us. Yeah, we all got it. To this the youth replied, Indeed, you are correct. But before devoting myself to intensive practice, there are matters I should clear up, <laughs> such as the needs of my family, as well as my, ho my house and property. When these things have been accomplished, I shall return and speak with you again. The old man grunted, Your attitude is empty of reason. Previously, I had also lived with the thought to engage in practice soon. Work is like a man's beard. No matter how much you cut it, the cutting never ends. The affairs of this life, in other words. The beard just grows out stronger. For me, years passed like this, but the work never reached an end. Procrastination is merely self-deception. If your idea is to procrastinate forever, you will have no hope of spiritual accomplishment. And our conversation has been in vain. You should just return to your home and leave this old man to meditate in peace. The youth cried out in shock, Oh man, do not be so harsh with me. It would be insane for me to simply abandon everything I've undertaken. To this the old man replied, Yes, you can say this to me, but the Lord of Death who dwells in the South does not consider the state of one's plans. You should speak with him. When he comes to call on you, he will not ask if you are young or old, high or low, rich or poor, ready or not. All are forced to go alone, leaving behind their unfinished works. The thread of life suddenly is broken, like a rope snapping under a heavy load. There is no time for plan making. To die without spiritual knowledge is to die in pathetic helplessness. At that time, one's attitude will change towards the importance of ephemeral works. Would it not be more useful to change the mind now, while time for training remains? But useful advice is rare in this world, and those who follow it even rarer. At this, the youth was overcome with emotion and prostrated to the old man, saying, Not the highest schooler on the most ornate throne, nor any of the great scholars or yogis have ever given me a more profound teaching. O oh man, you are a true spiritual friend, and I will follow your advice. Please speak to me further on this matter. You see Chung in his old age talking to us this way. That's why this poem hit me. The old man answered, I have lived on this earth for many years and thus have seen much of life. Nothing is more difficult to understand than the principles of the spiritual path, the way producing higher being, liberation, and omniscient enlightenment. It is not easy to cultivate an experience of the truth taught by the enlightened ones, and even more difficult to do so in old age. Youth is a time to learn and to become familiar with the teachings. Then, as one grows old with the passing years, it is easy to dwell within practice. If one really understands even a single point of the teachings, all activities are accordingly benefited. There is no need to intellectualize. 
When spiritual experience has been generated, all actions of body, speech, and mind take on a spiritual perspective. The root of practice is to rely correctly on a spiritual master and to guard one's trainings as carefully as one does one's eyes. Turn your back on worldly works and engage in study, contemplation, and meditation upon all the beneficial essence of teachings of the Buddha and of Sankapa, his region of, in Tibet. He's a Galupa. In a, by applying oneself in this way, while establishing as a background the methods for collecting merit and purifying the mind of negative stains, illumination falls into one, one's very hand. Then, my son, you will know joy and your aspirations will be fulfilled. Create the causes. Do the thing. It will come to you. Just, the conversation proceeded in this way, and the two became spiritual friends. They dwelt together in the forest, free from the eight worldly concerns, fully absorbed in the practice of meditation. This is, thus is complete my story of the old man and the youth who met in the forest one day and the record of the conversation that ensued. I have written it out to inspire myself and others in the practice of Dharma. I, the author, Konchak Tempe Dronme, I'm not particularly experienced in life, but I thought that if for posterity, posterity's sake this conversation were to be written down, some benefits may arise in the hearts of mankind. So we're carrying that torch right now. So what's there to say? It makes sense. <laughs> Nobody can do it for you. Nobody dies for you. You do it yourself. Anyway, enough. Sounding like an old man parent. That's ain't kids. I should take the advice myself, you know. Old granola that I am. Remember the old granolas, Jackie? <laughs> so, let me check the time. All right, good. I'm going to continue where we left off with Geshe Sopa last week. It was that little uh, question that he asked. I'll repeat the, the next to the last paragraph that I said. He said, this brings up an interesting point to debate. All types of supernormal knowledge, such as seeing past lives, perceive their objects directly unmixed with a conceptual image. So when you have supernormal knowledge of your past lives, you perceive them directly. But how is this possible? The past life is not here in the present, so how can supernormal knowledge directly perceive it? Are those lives still there? Are they permanent? Is supernatural knowledge seeing an image of the past in the present? You can debate this. So he answered now. In an ordinary sense, memory is thought. We ended on these two lines. It perceives a conceptual image, a past thing, through the power of certain potentialities that this thing has left on the mind stream. It left some potencies on the mind stream. Okay? This means that past things are not totally non-existent in that their effects continue to function. Simple. You think of something in the past, that was pleasant. Ah, yeah. Oh, those were the days, right? Those were the nights. Never mind. That's what he's saying here. It functions. It's not here now, but it functions. It functions on us who are here now. The thinker, rather. When we say something is not existent, it means it has never existed in the past, does not exist now, and will never exist in the future. Here comes the logic, and it's very important to understand this. What they mean by existent, non-existent. A common example of a non-existent is a rabbit horn. A rabbit horn has never existed in the past, not now, and will not exist in the future. However, past things do exist. They are not present at the moment, but they are not totally non-existent. They are functional things because we do remember them. Past things exist, they exist conventionally, though they do not exist Inherently, of course, nothing does. The object of memory is not here right now as it appears. The object is gone. It does not exist permanently. However, there is a causal relationship functioning. We can prove this. Think of your past uh, paramours or whatever, you know. However, there's a causal relationship functioning, a chain of related causes and, and the causes and effects experienced through the ripening of a potentiality that enables us to remember the object now. This is not theory. This is reality. How our memory works and how it affects us now. This is not speculation. You prove it yourself. 
Therefore, the object remembered and the memory of it do exist, but they do not exist in the way that they appear. To say that they are false or mistaken things means that they dependently arise. False now, because we they appear as inherently existent, but that appearance is false. They dependently arise. That's what he's running around getting to. Past things are neither totally non-existent nor inherently existent. Past and present things are dependently related. So and then he's going to talk now about uh, the mathematicians in the audience will love this. The definition of contradiction. What you know? I don't know. If, and we, if P is P, P is Q, Q. Is that, never mind. That's where I always leave. You know, I fall asleep. I look at my phone. So this is page one eighteen of volume five of Geshe Sopa's commentary on the Lama. Avoiding the extreme views while maintaining the law of non-contradiction. He's not just talking to play games with logic. He's trying to show us how we avoid views of eternalism and nihilism. Sounds easy when we talk about it. Yeah, I know, eternalism, things are permanent. Nihilism, nothing. No, I know that. It's more subtle than that if you want to apply it to changing your life. No. Yeshe Sopa says, those who accept that things are inherently existent have fallen, have fallen into the extreme of eternalism. Those who accept that all external and internal things are non-things without the ability to function, bang, have fallen to the extreme view of nihilism. That's the strictest uh, definition. In contrast, those who say that these things are merely existent do not propound absolute reality or inherent existence. Those who say that all these things have no inherent nature have not fallen into nihilism. They're not saying there's nothing there. They're saying they have no inherent nature. Keep repeating this because it's important to affect our mind with it. Repeat it to yourself. I'm not gonna... <laughs> Therefore, on the side of non-existence, we have to distinguish between non-existent and non-inherently existent. Non-existent and non-inherently existent. And on the side of existence, we have to ex uh, distinguish between merely existent and inherently existent. Sounds like a lot of words, but you have to go over them. Maybe he'll flesh it out. These are not simply terminological, terminological differences, not just words here. They are important distinctions that we need to ascertain in order to avoid falling to the two extremes. These are tools you really need to get real about this meditation. You tired of any? A little bit. No. <laughs> have an espresso. That's why we have espresso here yeah, for that I purpose. I sleep all night if I have So an what? <laughs> the night is young. Yeah. I'm making jokes when I say being a, being a wise guy. We do not say that things do not exist. This is the error made earlier by Tibetan scholars. Remember when the Lama was kind of seemed like complicated? Well, you don't want to say they exist. They say, duh, 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 duh. this is nicely stretched out by Geshe Sopa to make that paragraph much easier to understand. This is the comment that you got back by the, the realists. You know, we don't say that things exist or do not exist. This is the error made by the earliest Tibetan scholars. Accordingly to their view, they see that things exist, that to say that things exist, this is their point of view, means that it means accepting things to be inherently existent. And they know that. So they avoid the extreme of eternalism by saying things are not existent. And to say that things do not exist means accepting things to be totally non existent. So they avoid the extreme of nihilism by saying things are not non existent. Make up your mind. That's what's going on. That passage said the exact same thing. Thus, they try to avoid falling into the two extremes simply by saying the words, things are neither existent nor non-existent. Even sounds like Nagarjuna, if you're not paying attention. Ah, but it ain't. But positing this view only creates contradictions. It does not explain the meaning of Madhyamaka, the middle way between the extremes, in the slightest. These early Tibetan scholars who considered themselves Madhyamakas allowed their opponents only two alternatives when refuting them in debate. Yet when proving their own assertions, they allowed themselves a third alternative. <laughs> Woo, they stacked the deck, those mm, terrible. Being neither existent nor non-existent. So what is it? He's going to go on that tack now and show you when you, it's, there are certain things that are what they call dichotomies or whatever. So, but when we examine whether things inherently exist, we are faced with only two possibilities. A thing, possibilities. A thing is either inherently existent or not inherently existent. That's it. There is no third possibility. 
If there were a third alternative, something that is not included within these two possibilities, then it would be wrong to limit our examination to just two alternatives. But these are like excluded middle, whatever you want to call it. Dichotomy. I like to say that. It's easier for me to understand. Maybe it's not exactly right. For example, when determining a color, it is illogical to restrict ourselves to two alternatives. We should not ask, is it blue or is it yellow? The question is inappropriate because there is a third alternative, a color that is neither blue nor yellow, such as red. So that's not a situation where there's either or. Not every color is either blue or yellow. There's more. However, it is appropriate to analyze whether or not things are inherently existent because this is a genuine dichotomy. It is based on the general dichotomy of whether or not objects of knowledge exist. Elementary logic textbooks, and here comes logic by the boatload, elementary logic textbooks in the Tibetan tradition list as synonyms, object of knowledge, object of comprehension, comprehension, existence, established based, and phenomenon. They spend nominon. They all mean the same thing. The term object of knowledge indicates that something is known. To exist means to be established by valid knowledge. So things need a mind to verify their existence. Very interesting. Although we fall to the extreme, there are things that are there and I'm here. Hmm. Interesting. To exist means to be established by valid knowledge. If something is known, then it exists. If it's not known, it does not exist. Now, you might say, well, I don't know if you know, so maybe it doesn't exist. As long as someone knows it, that's valid. A valid mind has uh, ascertained that it exists. You may not know it now. I may not know it now, of course, but we will. So, so that's why you cannot say, ah, it doesn't exist. Prove it's non-existence. Then you can take that position. Big thing in Buddhism. Ah, past lives don't exist. Prove their non-existence. Otherwise, just hang on and look into it. We say that every time we meet, but it's important. So, if something is known, it exists. If not known, it does not exist. We cannot say that something is neither existent nor non-existent. So then what is it? When we examine whether a thing is inherently existent or not inherently existent, or whether a thing is permanent or impermanent, or whether it is one or many and so on, it makes sense to limit the alternatives to two because that's it. One, singular or plural? No more. They are opposite, and our object of investigation must be one or the other. For example, when Madhyamak has examined true existence, they consider, if something truly exists, then it must exist as one or as many. Why? This is related to a more general dichotomy. If something exists, it is either a single entity or multiple. There's no third ground. They're boiling things down to a place where they can really examine and the mind now can rest knowing there's no other alternatives so we really dig in. That's the technique. Therefore, if something truly exists, it must be truly one or truly many. Truly means inherent. When considering a dichotomy, there are only two possibilities. A third ground or possibility is excluded. To posit something that is neither of the two is utterly meaningless. Nagarjuna says in his refutation of objections, if it negates non-inherently existent, then it proves inherently existent, okay? It's either one or the other, so if you got rid of one, then it's obviously the other one. That's it. That's so this kind of thinking works. This is a powerful rejection of the view that things are not existent, not non-existent, not both, and not neither. <laughs> According to people who hold this view, there is no basis for making a definite enumeration of just two possibilities. They say that refuting one of the pair, existent or non-existent, does not prove the other. They're not thinking because there are other possibilities that leave the ground wide open. In this way, they are continually consumed by doubt. So the mind's not wholly in on it because that's not a true st uh, statement. They, they're operating in, in terms of an imagined reality. So it would be helpful to understand the Bo Buddhist notion of contradictory here. I don't know, you have contradictory in, in math as a strict term. Yes or no? Is it kind of binary. Binary. Oh my God, binary. No, really. All right. So it would be helpful to understand the Buddhist notion of contradictory here. This is a little thick, but, you know, it's the way they work. Let's get used to it. Hear it at least once and think, oh, they're very clever. 
In general, if two things are contradictory, then there is nothing that instantiates both. There is no common ground or shared basis. Among various ways of being contradictory, there are two basic ones, direct and indirect. Of course, it has to be complicated. <laughs> Something I can't understand. Direct is the strictest. We will come to that below. There are two ways of being indirectly contradictory. Maybe the politicians hear about this. There are two ways of being indirectly contradictory. The first is when being both things is impossible. But being neither is possible. An example of this is red and yellow. Whatever is red cannot be yellow, and whatever is yellow cannot be red, right? There is no positive common ground, something that is both. But there is a common ground of their negations, something that is neither red nor yellow, such as blue. You got the way they think? I'll repeat it again. Whatever is red cannot be yellow, and whatever is yellow cannot be red. There is no positive common ground something that is both, but it, there is a common ground of their negations. Get rid of both of them. Something that is neither red nor yellow, such as blue. Different situation. So if something is not red, that does not, then it does not have to be yellow. It can be a color other than these two. Therefore, red and yellow are not directly contradictory. In Western philosophy, they are called contrary. I don't know if that's a loaded term, contrary, a technical term. This is set theory. I wish Eugene was here, but he would argue with him. We'd get, I can fall asleep. Anyway, all right, so get used to this. This is one more paragraph of this. And the, the second way of being indirectly contradictory is where both things are, is impossible and being neither is also impossible. There is no third ground. Here comes algebra or possibility at all, whether positive or negative. If something is not F, then it must be G. And if it's not G, then it must be F. These are contradictory in terms of reality, but they are not contradictory in terms of understanding. So according to Buddhist logic, they are not directly contradictory. An example of this is permanent and produced. Now it's coming back. Permanent and produced. Whatever is produced cannot be permanent, and whatever is permanent cannot be produced. There is no positive common ground, something that is both. Moreover, there is no common ground of their negation, something that is neither produced nor permanent. Whatever exists must be one or the other. See the way they work? You know? It is impossible for anything to be neither. So if an existent thing is not permanent, then it must be produced, and vice versa. Permanent and produced are contradictory in the sense of being mutually eliminating. If you mentally or verbally cut out permanent, this does not mean that you will naturally understand produced. That's the problem, unless you're really well trained. Or if you cut out produced, then you do not necessarily understand permanent. A trained mind would. Someone who says, well, everything is permanent, it's not produced. We don't know this. No. Whatever is produced cannot be permanent, and whatever is permanent cannot be produced. All right. In terms of reality, that's the case. But in terms of its verbal expression saying it is not permanent, does not express that it is produced. Most people would understand that. Only a... A Buddhist logician would. The word permanent does not eliminate produced nor prove not produced. Also in terms of understanding, as soon as you know that something is not permanent, this does not mean that you understand it to be produced. Or if you know that something has arisen from causes and conditions, this does not immediately eliminate the thought of it being permanent. And we do this all the time. I know the speed causes it, but we see it as permanent. We have to stop and think, oh wait, it's cause, it's not permanent on the trail of being out of business. That's, we have to think that way. So permanent, on page 121, so permanent and produced are contradictory without any third ground, whether expressed in an affirmative or negative manner. They are contradictory in the sense of being mutually eliminated, but they are not directly contradictory in the sense of being mutually eliminating. That's a little stick, sticky, but... Uh, so we'll leave it at that. It's very important that we get... Used to this way of thinking, this is the way, if you're going to go this way, um, it takes time and it takes multiple readings. Read it once, put it aside. Come back again, come back again. After a while, it seeps in. The mind that doesn't understand it on the surface is taking notes underneath. You'll see. You have to have patience and perseverance. Joyful perseverance, they say. <laughs> Sometimes they don't feel joyful. Anyway, 
for whom will we pray if we're still transmitting? Hi, we can Good morning, Kuala Lumpur. Who else is here? That's it. Only one. So, what's your friend's name? We'll pray for him again. I forgot. Roger. Roger, okay. Richard Belzer. Richard Belzer, yes, that great actor. He, yeah. The Baltimore guy. I like to, isn't it? I prostrate to the omniscient one. <clears throat> Thus the Buddha, Bhagavad, Tathagata, Arahat, Samyak, Sang Buddha, the learned and virtuous one, the Sugata, the knower of the world, the charioteer and tamer of beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of devas and humans is the Buddha, Bhagavad. The Tathagata is in accord with all merit. He does not waste the roots of virtue. He is completely ornamented with all patience. He is the basis of the treasures of merit. He is adorned with the minor marks. He blossoms with the flowers of the major marks. His activity is timely and appropriate. Seeing him, he is without disharmony. He brings true joy to those who long with faith. His knowledge cannot be overpowered. His strength cannot be challenged. He is the teacher of all sentient beings. He is the father of bodhisattvas. He is the king of noble ones. He is the guide of those who journey to the city of Nirvana. He possesses immeasurable wisdom. He possesses inconceivable confidence. His speech is completely pure. His melody is pleasing. One never has enough of seeing him. Excuse me. His form is incomparable. He's not stained by the realm of desire. He's not stained by the realm of form. He's not affected by the formless realm. He is completely liberated from suffering. He is completely and utterly liberated from the skandhas. He is not possessed with datus. His ayatanas are controlled. He has completely cut the knots. He is completely liberated from extreme torment. He is liberated from craving. He has crossed over the river. He is perfected in all the wisdoms. He abides in the wisdom of the Buddha Bhagavat, who arise in the past, present, and future, does not abide in nirvana. He abides in the ultimate perfection. He dwells on the bhumi where he sees all sentient beings. All these are the perfect virtues of the greatness of the Buddha Bhagavat. The holy dharma is good at the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Its meaning is excellent. Its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted. It is completely perfect and completely pure. It completely purifies. The Bhagavat teaches the dharma well. It brings complete vision. It is free from sickness. It is always timely. It directs one further. Seeing it fulfills one's purpose. It brings discriminating insight for the wise. The Dharma, which is taught by the Bhagavat, is revealed properly in the Vinaya. It is renunciation. It causes one to arrive at perfect enlightenment. It is without contradiction. It is pithy. It is trustworthy and puts an end to the journey. Yes. As for the Sangha of the Great Yana, they enter completely, they enter insightfully, they enter straightforwardly, enter harmoniously. They are worthy of veneration with joined palms. They are worthy of receiving prostration. They are a field of glorious merit. They are completely capable of receiving all gifts. They are an object of generosity. They are a great object of complete generosity. The protector who possesses great kindness, the omniscient teacher, the basis of oceans of merit and virtue, I prostrate to the Tathagata. Pure the cause of freedom from passion, virtuous, liberating from the lower realms. This alone is the supreme ultimate truth. I prostrate to the Dharma, which is peace. Having been liberated, they show the path to liberation. They are fully dedicated to the disciplines. They are a holy field of merit and possess virtue. I prostrate to the Sangha. I prostrate to the Buddha, the leader. I prostrate to the Dharma, the protector. I prostrate to the Sangha, the community. I prostrate respectfully and always to these three. The Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. The Dharma's virtues are inconceivable. The Sangha's virtues are inconceivable. Having faith in these inconceivable, therefore the fruitions are inconceivable. May they be born in a completely pure realm. As a cause for the quick return of Rato Chungla Rinpoche, His Holiness has suggested we recite this prayer for the flourishing of Jay Sankapa's teaching, which is on the Tibet Center website in the FAQ section. Scroll down to prayers. Though he is the father producer of all conquerors as a conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds. Through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. When of yore in the presence of Buddha Indra Kedu, he made his vow, the conqueror and his offspring praised his powerful courage. Through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a conch and prophesied. Through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. His pure view free of eternity or destruction. His pure meditation cleanse of dark fading and fog. His pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders. May the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Learn, since he extensively sought out learning, reverend, rightly applying it to himself, 
good, dedicating all for beings and the doctrine. May the Kakulosan's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scripture is definitive and interpretive without contradiction, advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct. May the Kakulosan's teachings flourish. Listening to explanation of the three Pitakas, realized teachings, practice of the three trainings, his skilled and accomplished life story is amazing. May the Kankwa Losang's teachings flourish. Outwardly calmed and subdued by the hero's conduct, inwardly trusting in the two stages practice, he allied without clash the good paths of Sutra and Tantra. May the Kankwa Losang's teachings flourish. The mining voidness explained as the causal vehicle. With great bliss achieved by method, the effect vehicle. Hard essence of 80,000 Dharma bundles. May the Kankwa Losang's teachings flourish. By the power of the ocean, of oath-bound doctrine protectors, like the main guardians of the three beings' paths, the quick-acting Lord, Vaishravana, Karmayama, may the Kankar Losang's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious guru, Guru's lives, by the earth being full of good, learned, reverend holders of the teachings, and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the Kankar Losang's teachings flourish. And now we will do eight verses on training the mind, which Venerable Karuna nicely explained. And it's on our website. You can go, all these things are on our website, these past uh, teachings, so you can go over them. Someone is calling from the past with one of those phones. <laughs> with the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all, and respectfully hold us to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind, and as soon as a disturbing emotion arising, arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings, as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer the victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone, without exception, all help and happiness directly and indirectly, and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mother's. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns, and by understanding all phenomena as like illusions, be released from the bondage of attachment. So first of all, thank you for your patience. Our next presentation will be Saturday afternoon at 1 o'clock, uh, the White Tara Sadhana that we do, and we will have our usual uh, White Tara Sadhana and recitation. That should end about 10 of 2. From that time until 3 o'clock, there'll be lunch and frolicking and happiness and great joy. And then from 3 to 3.30, there'll be silent meditation or reading or whatever you want to do. And then at 3.30, the shindig resumes. So that's our little thing. It'll be the last appearance, uh, non-inherent appearance, of course, of Rever Reverend Karuna, who has blessed us with her brightness, et cetera, and so forth. Anyway, thanks a lot, guys, for being patient. Facebook is driving us wild. We have to find another alternative. Until we do, anyway, thanks for your kind patience in trying to understand this difficult section of the Lamrim. Big love to all of you. Take care.